in the cross. Be my glory ever in the cross, in the cross. This is a fitting song to start our service with this evening. This is our Ash Wednesday service, and I welcome you into the beginning of the Lenten season. Yesterday was some call it Shrove Tuesday, and others, like myself, call it Mardi Gras. Well, whatever way you celebrated the beginning or the ending of the previous season, we begin the Lent season tonight. I want you to pay attention to your bulletins because there will be a few things that we will do there as we go through the rest of our service. And it will begin now with our welcome. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God has mercy. Lord Jesus, you place on our foreheads the sign of death, remembering that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Teach us to number our days that we may gain wisdom of heart. O Christ Jesus, you place on our foreheads the sign of your saving cross. Turn from, from sin and be faithful to the gospel. How can I turn from sin unless I turn to you? You speak, you raise your hand, you touch my mind and call my name. Turn to the Lord your God again. These days of our favor leave a blessing as you pass on me and all your people. Turn to us, Lord God, and we shall turn to you.
number 785 in the back of our hymn. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your divine mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your, uh, your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born to you, and I have been sinful since my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Urge me with wisdom, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain, and sustain in me a willing spirit. And I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Amen. You may be seated. At this time I will share our heart because as we have just read in our Psalter, we are dealing with the Lent season and we're dealing with confession, repentance, and we're dealing with turning away from those things which God will not be pleased with and turning towards God. May the Almighty and merciful God who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we turn from wickedness and live, accept your repentance, forgive your sins to the newness of life. Amen. Amen. Turn with me now in your Bibles to Romans Chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you will, please stand and turn to hymn number 430, O Master, let me walk with thee. This is a prayer of him, and we're going to sing all four stanzas.
Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sora, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength, and how we can overpower him, so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh thongs that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought him, brought her seven fresh thongs that, didn't, that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the thongs as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, until now, you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with a pin. Again she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled down the pen and the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, 
She sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with, with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair. And so he began, and so, and so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us bow our heads for word of prayer. Almighty God, this evening we come to you thanking you for this season of self-examination. This season of looking inward and also looking up, looking onward towards you and looking out, and that you may share with us your desires. Draw us ever closer to you and help us go grow closer in our walk with you. We thank you this evening, Lord, for this Ash Wednesday. We thank you for reminding us that from dust we came and to dust we shall return. But that is only the physical side. But reminded us also that our spirits will reside with you forever. We thank you for that blessing among all of the blessings in our lives. And we thank you for continuing to guide us through this season and through this time. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Something that we should probably consider, not just for this season, but throughout the rest of our lives. Having self-control during Lent and for life. Having self-control during Lent and for life. Self-control means the act of denying oneself. Controlling our impulses, our emotions, our desires, our actions. This is what Lent is all about. Turning from the world's obsessions and turning to God. The Bible offers many examples of men who fail because they lacked this essential element of self-control. But no one sticks in my mind like Samson. The undisputed heavyweight, if you will, the heavyweight champion of ancient Israel. <coughs> Samson's life was filled with lessons, examples, and applications that are still relevant today. In one sense, Samson is one of the best-known heroes in the Bible. Generations of children have marveled at the story of Samson defeating the Philistine with the jawbone of a donkey. Many teenagers know about Samson's long hair and how Delilah tricked the secret out of him. Now, on a side note, I have to wonder how she tricked him when she asked him four times. But that's another subject. Most of us know that he had his eyes poked out, and as he was dying, he pushed the pillars of their temple apart. And he killed 3,000 Philistines along with himself. It is a story that is both tragic and heroic. Sometimes we read the stories of men like David, like Moses or Abraham, and we think, I could never be like them. They seem to be in a different category, as if we should label them special cases, and the rest of us as regular people. After all, Abraham was the friend of God, and Moses saw God face to face, and David was a man after God's own heart. Those are great stories, and we profit greatly from reading them. But those men don't seem very much like us. But not so with Samson. He's a lot like us. He had some struggles, but those struggles were able to get him to where he was back in a relationship with God, even if it didn't last for as long as it should have. He had struggles, but through his struggles, we can be better people because we can learn from his challenges and his mistakes. 
In Proverbs it says, it's better to learn from someone else's mistakes than your own. The wise person learns from others, the fool learns from their own mistakes. There are three timely lessons that I want to share with you about Samson's life that will help us, not only during the Lent season, but through the rest of our lives. It has been well said that we learn much more from defeat than we do from victory. Failure is a wonderful teacher if we're willing to learn from it. As we consider Samson's story, three timely lessons stand out. These apply to every person who desires to develop the spiritual quality of self-control. First, unless we deal with our problems, they will come back to haunt us again and again. We may want to write these because during this season, we can continue to revisit these, not only through the season, but the rest of our lives as we see. If we don't deal with our problems, they will come back to haunt us again and again. Many people never deal with the real problems they face. Anger, bitterness, an unforgiving spirit, an undisciplined life, or even greed. Whatever the problem, we have lifted up the carpet and have swept it under the rug and have said, that hasn't bothered me for six years, so I'm basically okay now. But just as soon as you say something like that, the very next moment, that issue shows its ugly head. I beg us not to say that. Some of us need to take a good look in the mirror and see the way we really are. The hardest thing we will ever say is these words. I need help. I have a problem I can't handle. I need help. I have a problem I can't handle. But isn't that the first step in any recovery program? Maybe we are not exactly like AA or NA, but maybe we should be CA, Christians Anonymous. <laughs> Step one, admit you have a problem. We will never get better until we are willing to say, I really need help in this area of my life. Mm -hmm. Unless we learn to deal with our challenges now, we are going to deal with them later, and they will only get more complex over time. I have yet to see a problem that lingers get better. Some people don't want tutors. And I, I really appreciate this next statement when I found out who had a tutor. As I looked up some of the most famous scientists and philosophers who had tutors, you know, however these tutors uh, taught these people, we can learn from both the tutor as well as the student. These people would not be known today if they did not have tutors. Einstein, we all think Einstein is the greatest genius that ever lived. Einstein had a tutor. You may never have heard the, the name Max Tommy, but that is the name of his tutor. Max Tommy was an ophthalmologist, but he taught Einstein math and reading and other things to where he became one of the greatest scientists that has ever lived. That is the first thought. Unless we do something about the situation, face it head on, it will haunt us over and over again. Second, unless we learn the difference between being empowered by the Spirit and controlled by the Spirit, we will fall just like Samson did. I'm going to slow down on this one because I have to look at this one myself. Unless we learn the difference between being empowered by the Spirit versus being controlled by the Spirit, we will fall just like Samson. It's so very possible for a Christian to be empowered by the Spirit of God, to do certain things, and yet not to have his or her life yielded to the full control of the Holy Spirit. How else do we explain Christians falling deep into sin? Christians can be empowered by the Spirit of God, but at the point of their fall, they were not controlled by the Holy Spirit. Samson, at certain points, was empowered by the Spirit of God. But there was never a point in his whole life when for a very long time, he was under the control of the Spirit of God. This is a vital point because we tend to confuse outward blessing with great inner godliness. But the two don't always go together. 
There's a scripture that says gifts and callings are found unrepentant. You can have the gift that God gives you, but you still have to go to God and repent and be closer in your walk to God to receive the full blessing that God has for you. In the words of Roman, Romans 8.13, Samson never put to death the deeds of the flesh. Therefore, he continually made bad choices. We say to little ones in nursery school, let's make good choices. Nobody probably told Samson that. Maybe he would have done better if he had heard those words a few times. Make good choices. But this also explains why he did not know that the Lord had left him. When you're standing in a room and you're talking and you look up and nobody's there and you didn't realize they left, that's a problem. When you have the Spirit of God leave you and you don't recognize it, that's an infinitely worse problem. Mm -hmm. It's not just enough to be able to accomplish good things or win studying, studying battles on the, on the field of victory. Unless your life is under the control of the Spirit, we can just fall like Samson did. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in Hebrews chapter 11, 32, it lists Samson as a man of faith. But we remember him as much more for his emotional weakness as for his enormous physical strength. This paradox illustrates what happens when a person never learns the secret of self-control. Samson could control an army, but he could not control his own desires. And that's in Proverbs as well. It is greater the man who controls himself than an army. The word is self-control, not other control. Third, unless we yield our desires completely to God, we risk falling prey to the delights of this world. Unless we yield our desires completely to God, we risk falling prey to the delights of this world. Mm -hmm. This makes Delilah look bad, but I don't mean to smear her name. She was who she was. I suspect that she was just a woman who was hungry for a relationship. She was looking for love in all the wrong places. She wanted somebody to spend some time with her. And who better than the handsome, powerful, famous Samson? I don't really blame Delilah too much. She was ready, but he was willing, and they both were able. Samson was the one who went down and found her. Unless we take the open areas of our lives and lay it before God, we risk falling prey to the, to the Delilahs of this world. Mm -hmm. It can happen to any of us. Let us look at some of the modern-day Delilahs. Delilahs of the world will cause us to depend on things of the world and not depend on God. Before we wrap this time up this evening, I want us to end on this positive note by asking what self-control looks like on a daily basis. We see what it doesn't look like when it comes to Samson. And we've seen other examples in the biblical time and in the modern time. But let's look at what it takes. Samson shows us what happens when a person lacks this but what we, what, what we will look for and look like when our lives are controlled by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We will live for God on Monday just as much as we do on Sunday mm -hmm. and Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and on and on. Mm -hmm. We will transform the worldly desire into passion for Jesus Christ. We will do right the first time. We will admit mistakes without making excuses. We will laugh more and worry less. As we know, worrying is sin. So if you're going to worry, don't pray. If you're going to pray, don't worry. Pick one and stick with it. This is what God wants, to be in control. God wants to be the pilot of our souls that we might live a life that shines and glorifies God for all to see. Mm -hmm. Having self-control through Lent and the rest of our lives is a key component of seeing God throughout eternity. Mm -hmm.
having self-control, not only in this season, but when the Lenten season ends and Easter Resurrection Sunday comes and we move on to the next days and weeks, let us continue to follow the pattern that we've learned during the Lenten season about self-control. Mm -hmm. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us prepare ourselves for the invitation to the observance of Lenten discipline. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church to observe and holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance and as a mark of our mortal nature, let us bow our heads for a moment of silence before our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer.
Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 The blood will never lose its power. I love that hymn. That's a really, really important hymn in the Baptist Church. Ooh. Boy, did we sing that song a lot. But it means a lot to me. Let's stand and sing Jesu, Jesu. Hymn number 432 in your Methodist hymn book. Jesu, Jesu. And you'll see there are one, two, three, four, what are called scores. And you're going to be singing the first. You can sing all of them, but it concludes with the top two. Just follow the choir. We'll lead you. Jesus, Jesus. Um, then we do the stanza back to the top, stanza back to the top, and we conclude. I hope you know it. I'll introduce it.